My name is Bruce Gillette. I am blessed to serve this year as the moderator for Presbyterians for Earth Care, a national organization within the Presbyterian Church USA that works to support individuals and congregations and presbyteries and our denomination in areas of caring for God's creation. We have a special emphasis, understandably, on the problem of climate crisis and how this is affecting many aspects of God's world, not only people, but all the creatures as well. We are blessed this evening to have a wonderful speaker, and you'll note in the chat this is not the first webinar we have offered. A few weeks ago, we were very grateful to have staff from Presbyterian Disaster Assistance do an hour-long webinar looking at how the Presbyterian Church is res responding to disasters, many of them that have been impacted by climate change. And you're welcome to use that in your local church, as you will be welcome to use this recording uh, in your local church. It will be posted on YouTube in the next few days. Um, we have other programs coming up in May that I'll put in the chat. One will be looking at the issue of divestment from fossil fuel industries. There's a variety of overtures uh, coming to this year's General Assembly and we will have a variety of perspectives shared at that evening program. And then a couple weeks after that in May, uh, we are going to have a couple of enthusiastic owners of electric cars and talking about all the joys of having an electric car, introductions for beginners and possible uh, helping buyers make a decision. Um, it'll, it truly has a very positive impact on the world. So those information will be in the chat. And you're welcome to put your name and where you're from in the chat, just so you can see how this is drawing from all over the, the country. People are interested in this topic. And if there are resources you think we would find helpful, put those in the chat as well. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks again for the beauty of your earth and for all of its wonders and joys and blessings it is to so many. We give you thanks for Dr. Sweet and for his gifts and intelligence and for the hard work he does in helping us understand what's going on in this world and sadly how sometimes we have impacted it very negatively. Bless him and his colleagues in their important work. Help us to listen to what science has to teach us and help us to follow so that we can be better stewards of this creation. Guide us in this evening. Be with not only the speaker, but all who are participating. May we be inspired to care for your creation all the more. We pray this in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So it's my pleasure to give an introduction to the person giving the introduction. Mark is a member of the steering committee of the Presbyterians for Earth Care and also a very well-known oceanographer and a newly retired member of the community uh, who has long served in NOAA, which our speaker is coming from. Mark, take it away, please. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, in the, the time that I worked for, uh, for NOAA, I had multiple opportunities to uh, interact with tonight's speaker and uh, particularly in some areas of uh, uh, committees and meetings on uh, uh, the impact that climate change is having on our, our world. Uh, tonight's speaker, Dr. William, or as I know him, Billy Sweet, um, is an oceanographer with NOAA's National Ocean Service in the Center for o Operational Oceanographic Products and Services, the mouthful that we normally just refer to as co-ops. Um, he uh, conducts research on changes in, in uh, nuisance to extreme coastal flooding due to sea level rise, has been involved in a, a wide number of, uh, of publications on sea level rise and, and its impacts. He received his PhD in oceanography from North Carolina State University, uh, a university that knows oceanography and a state that knows flooding. Um, he's helped the US military and others uh, assess their sea level rise related risks um, and uh, has been involved in the National Climate Assessment, 
through the uh, development of regional sea level rise scenarios. And it's that work on sea level rise that goes into the state of the high tide flooding reports uh, that he'll be talking about uh, tonight. Um, Billy li lives in uh, Annapolis where he experiences uh, sea level rise firsthand uh, in between opportunities to go uh, sailing out on, on the bay. And uh, I understand that uh, um, his parents are, are here to, to watch, which is great. Uh, and it's not just because uh, the, that they're here that, uh, that I'll say that he is an excellent oceanographer with a wonderful story to tell. And uh, I, I really have been looking forward to this. So uh, Billy, take it away. Well, thank you, Mark, and Bruce, and all for this opportunity. Hi, mom and dad. I know you're out there somewhere. Mom, your camera's on, so you're doing dishes. Careful. Um, no, this is wonderful. You know, we grew up Presbyterian. Uh, we went to a pretty active church in Raleigh, North Carolina. Many fond memories of camping on a lake that the Presbyterian owned. But more importantly, uh, got to spend time around thoughtful people, um, questioning everything around them voices for good and justice and uh, feel that uh, making a difference with NOAA uh, using their science, but being able to communicate the meaning of what we're observing and the implications uh, looking forward. So as Mark mentioned, um, I work for NOAA. Let me go ahead and I'll share my screen and, and start a presentation tonight. Hopefully um, it's gonna make sense. I'm, I'm going to cherry uh, coat the science as best I can, but you are going to get it um, hot off the press. This is national uh, leading science from a group of, of interagency uh, scientists and, and uh, application users and, and developers for the good of the country, the good of the military, the good of individuals. You know, everyone needs this information along, lives along the coast. So the title of the talk, Sea Level Rise, Climate Change Will Increase Future Risk of High Tide Flooding on U.S. Coasts. Um, so as mentioned, I work for NOAA. I've been working with them for about almost 15 years. Uh, really got, uh, went to NC State, uh, UNC, Chapel Hill, a couple of great universities, but had a, a lot of opportunities to spend time at the coast, uh, playing in the rivers upstream of the coast and aware of development, water quality as I got older, and really I'm glad to feel like I can help play play a part in helping take care of this, this world that we live. Um, I work for National Ocean Service. Uh, we have other organization within NOAA, the National Weather Service, National Marine Fisheries. We have a, a research group. So we, we really are involved in all sorts of science as it affects um, humans and, and species, whether it's weather or longer term projections, we really are, are trying to make sure that we understand and the world that we live in and how it's changing and how we are changing it. All right, jumping into the science. So there, this IPCC stands for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They had a six assessment report. This is the group that comes together every four or five years and has all the leading scientists and models uh, those that develop the models and run the models to, to come together to really try to answer some of the important questions of the world. How is it changing from temperature, from precipitation, drought, wildfire, and sea level rise? Um, this last report has, there are a series of reports been coming out over the last year. And as Bob Dylan once uh, saying, times they are changing. And unfortunately, uh, there's a lot of superlatives, especially as it comes to factors that are affecting uh, the ocean levels and sea levels. C carbon dioxide concentrations, the highest in at least the last 2 million years. Sea level rise, the fastest in the last 3,000 years. Arctic sea ice, the lowest in the last 1,000 years. And glacier retreat, unprecedented. You know, these are superlatives that we don't really want to report on, but they are happening and we are measuring them and we are measuring them well and the consequences of which are now uh, sort of unfolding in front of our eyes. Carbon dioxide, the levels are much higher than they've been in the last couple million years. And we know this because uh, the 
carbon dioxide or the oxygen isotopes are locked away in the ice in Antarctica and Greenland, and we drill down into it, and we can really sort of uh, diagnose the, the levels of carbon dioxide um, as this ice was laid. And we know that we are much higher than we have been in the last few million years. And that is starting to pose a problem. And we are the ones to blame for it through emissions and burning primarily of fossil fuels. There have been highs, there have been lows, and a lot of this will move in sync. Um, I would point out about four or 500 generations ago, if you think about it in that terms, maybe the great grandmothers and great grandfathers, uh, there was a land bridge and CO2 was, was much lower, uh, uh, so was sea level. And we started walking about this world. Um, some of the first inhabitants, the Native Americans were able to walk and, and come across. Sea levels were about 400 feet lower. So whether or not you actually believe that we're involved in this process of change, maybe the climate's always been changing, we, we hear. Um, we have really come and now we've used concrete and we've really built to this environment. We're not moving, we're not budging. So the climate's changing, sea levels are changing. And that's running amok with our systems uh, and it, it's, it's slow um, in lots of people's perspective, but it's a, it's a motion that it's a slow motion, something that's, that's ongoing now and it will change and it will have consequences. Uh, we know that CO2 levels and temperature and, uh, and CO2 levels, temperature and sea levels have been changing together in the last few million years. It's, they all three move in tandem. Um, one of the things that that folks, you know, tend to question is, well, temperature has been going up, but um, probably it's due to something else, solar irradiance, the amount of energy coming out of the sun. But we've been measuring this and we measure it well. And we see basically since the last 50 or so years, in particularly, the temperatures have been going up um, on the earth, whereas the amount of energy from the sun has not been going up. The trends uh, are not uh, together. There's a trend in temperature. There's not in the energy coming from the sun. That's not the reason. Um, and so with a warming climate that is ongoing, there's lots of other impacts. Precipitation, a warm air can hold more moisture. Your lips are chapped in the winter because it doesn't hold as much moisture. Warm climates, warm temperatures hold more moisture. And we've been seeing uh, as a remnant of that over the last 50, 60 years, the amount of precipitation coming down in short amounts of time has been increasing. So whether or not the overall amount of rain has been increasing, we've been getting it quicker. And that's been running amok in a lot of our uh, stormwater systems, but we see this as particularly as an issue all over the country, but largely focused in the Northeast and Southeast. Heavier rains are becoming the new normal. And as we project that into the future, this RCP stands for Representative Concentration Pathways, a, a pathway of, of higher emissions as they might model these and their responses as we move forward. And so when we look towards the end of the century, that tendency will continue to increase. Heavier rains will become the new normal and our design systems aren't meant to handle those. And so that is going to pose a problem whether we're talking sea level or not, but that's one of the consequences of a warming environment. Hurricanes and storms, well, they're supposed to intensify and there's some evidence that they already have. So in the Atlantic and the Northeast Pacific, uh, areas affecting, let's say, Hawaii and, 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 and Guam and, and other areas, the hurricanes are expected to increase in intensity. Not clear about frequency, but the intensity should increase. And the rainfall associated with them are expected to increase. And we have evidence, let's say, of Harvey and some of these un, just unprecedented events will occur. They are rare. It's hard to really diagnose. You've got to roll the dice a lot. But when we stimulate this, our, our modelers simulate this, this is the tendency. We're also expecting more, uh, more frequent and severe West Coast landfalling atmospheric rivers, those atmospheric rivers that just come in in California and really cause lots of problems. You know, the more moisture, warmer seas is a consequence. But we're here to talk about sea level rise. We I work for NOAA, but we also work with NASA. We work the United States Geological Survey, a lot of organizations that are invested in measuring a lot of the Earth system. And one thing we know for certain from measuring from space, from profilers in the ocean, that 
uh, global sea level has been rising and we know it's been rising. And this will just be a snapshot of the last 30 years from satellite. And we know it's not rising like water in the bathtub. So where it's redder, uh, millimeters per year, think three millimeters per year is about an inch every eight. Five, six millimeters a year is about an inch every five to six years. Um, so we know it's not uniform, but what the pattern we see is where there's warmer water, warmer water expands uh, sort of nonlinear more than, than cold water. And so we're seeing a lot of this, this ocean warming signal as well as increased contribution from uh, Greenland and Antarctica. So in essence, the mass, ocean mass, is about two parts of the, of the issue, where steric height would be warming. Thermal expansion is about one part. Uh, the Greenland and Antarctica, these are the contribution. This would go into the mass. So that as the land-based ice melts, it fills up the ocean. It's not so much the Arctic sea ice that's already in the ocean that's not affecting it. It's Antarctica, it's Greenland, it's mountain glaciers, about two millimeters per year. The ocean warming is about one millimeter. Together, we're, we're at a rate of over three millimeters a year. The ocean is rising an inch every eight years, but it's not uniform. So we see a lot of red along the east and Gulf Coast United States. That's a problem. We look at the United States. I, I started my work with NOAA working for the group that operated all the tide gauges around the country. It was great. High tide, low tide. We've been measuring it for a, over 100 years. Safe uh, shipping, maritime commerce. You know, it's very apolitical. Everyone boats. Everyone needs to get the boats in and out of the, the harbor. But long record shows sea level has been rising. And here is an average across the United States relative sea level rise. So the other component is if land is sinking, that will add to the observed or relative increase. And so we see across the United States as a whole, uh, about 0.3 meters is about a foot. We have about a foot of rise in the last 100 years. Um, but it's been accelerating and it's been accelerating since about the 1960s and 70s, kind of where that increase in temperature, the earlier graph I showed. Um, and that rate is expected to continue as the acceleration as long as the forcing maintains. And that would be the added uh, emissions, which is causing the temperatures to increase. Where is it headed is, is really the question that we are trying to address. We can look backwards and tell you what's occurred and what the impacts have been, but people need to know what to plan for. Uh, whether you're buying a house or you're building a seawall or the Army Corps of the Engineers who's required to build flood risk reduction projects that it should be in operation for over 50 years to keep people safe for big storms in the face of sea level rise. And so two months ago, we put out our last interagency report. I happen to be lead author working with a terrific set of co-authors from uh, several agencies, NASA, NOAA, EPA, the Department of Defense, Army Corps, uh, 23 co-authors, uh, representing the agencies that produce the science as well as agencies that consume the science. Um, and it's important to work together so you actually understand what it is, the questions that are being asked so you can deliver the right types of science. You package it up in the right way so it fits. They need a circle, don't give them a square. Um, you know, what's moving the dial? You can't just, the most recent science doesn't always change the needle. It needs to be trusted and true consensus. And so this is a series of, of agency reports. We had one in 2017. We did one for the military in, in 2016. We had a report in 2012 uh, that really tries to answer, at least in this one, three important questions, um, building off of the series of reports prior to it. How much should we expect by 2050 in the next 30 years? That's an important question. Uh, folks need to know it's, it's tangible, it's in our headlights. But how much could sea levels rise by the end of the century or over a hundred years from now? What is the plausible rise amounts? That's important to know. Uh, for, for risk management, you need to know what the very unlikely outcomes could be. And more importantly, it's not mean sea level that impacts you. It's, it's the stuff on top. The ocean is moving. There's motion in the ocean. It's the tides. It's the storms, whether they're nor'easters or hurricanes or just a change of prevailing wind. That causes the ocean to move. And so in terms of us living on land, what's the risk, let's say, of a two-foot flood or a three-foot flood or a four-foot? And that over relative to the average high tide, typically which delineates typically dry from typically wet. Okay, so what are sea level rise scenarios? That's what we put out. Well, 
we want to give sort of the plausible range, not what the most likely is, but what could happen within uh, can, within the science as the science understands. Um, and they're all based on, you know, future, it, looking in the future, we don't have a, a magic ball because it's really tuned to future warming. We know as the oceans and atmospheres warm, we have more melt of land-based ice and we have more thermal ex expansion. So it's really conditional upon human actions. It, that's not a political statement, it's a scientific statement. And so we have five scenarios and they go from 0.3 meters by 2100 or about a foot all the way up to two meters by the end of the century or approximately six feet. And what I'm showing here in all these colorful dots is that if we keep emissions and warming low, then we have a better chance of staying to these low scenarios. So you see the big red dot there at the low. But as we go to higher emissions and higher warming, so what I mean by higher warming is, let's see, two degrees C, three degrees C, four degrees C, above pre-industrial, that's where we, we sort of make these measurements. We're about 1.2 degrees C above pre-industrial. The trajectory would suggest we're somewhere between two and a half and three degrees C by the end of the century, unless we change, um, could be higher, could be lower, but that's sort of an extrapolation. So to get, as we get to these higher scenarios, we need higher warming. So Higher warming equals a greater risk for higher sea level. And this would be global amounts. We'll talk about how that equals local. But there's also another factor here. You might have heard about some of these doomsday glaciers in Antarctica, some of these uh, you know, instabilities in Thorpe's Glacier and others. Um, you know, there are the known unknowns that we recognize in the geological record that sea level has changed and changed rather rapidly under even relatively similar ice configurations as today. So not necessarily when sea level is 500, 400 feet lower 12,000 years ago, that was it during the end of a, a major uh, a glaciation period. But we're talking about 125,000 years ago and two to three million years ago where the temperatures and the CO2 levels were about the same, but global uh, sea levels were five to 10 meters higher than they were today. We understand there's a commitment that we are headed for probably much higher sea levels already about one degree C warming commits generally based upon calibration of the past about two meters of higher sea level. Does that happen by 2100 or does that happen by 2400? Could that happen rapidly? We understand there are feedback me mechanisms of rapid disintegration of these ice sheets. The major ones we're more concerned about. We don't really factor them in. You can only model something that you really understand. If you have to have a mathematical equation, but if you haven't have the right parameters, then you actually then got to, uh, you've got to get your experts in the room who do these models and you sit them all down, a hundred of them and say, knowing what you know, does this capture the likelihood? So it'd be like the president lining up his, 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 his advisors or, or her advisors, um, maybe 50 of them, maybe 10 of them say, okay, give me your assessment, give me your assessment. And then from that, I will make my assessment. That's sort of how these structured elicitation work goes, but this all pulls from the last uh, climate assessment of the international uh, agencies. We aren't making up new science. We are pulling from the science that's been done and characterizing it for consumption in the United States. So in, in short, there is reason to believe that we could have two meters of sea level rise by the end of the century. It's very unlikely, but we can't take it off the table. In short, emissions matter. There's a lot of things that matter and for, for, for good reasons, as we've heard in the news over the last several uh, years, emissions matter. Global sea level rise and there's regional differences. So we know again, the land melting of land-based ice. We know water expands and there is a small uh, component of land uh, storage, whether you build a lot of dams in the fifties, it actually, it rains from the ocean, evaporates, and it gets locked up in land. We actually saw a slowdown in global sea levels. Now we do a lot of pumping of groundwater, and that water eventually flows in the ocean. We can see a slight contribution, but the main two factors are thermal expansion. But the real elephant in the room of where we're headed is the melting of land-based ice. It's not going to be uniform. We show the picture prior. It says this is how sea level has been rising the last three decades. It wasn't the same everywhere. And it's not the same for two ocean reasons. Is ocean circulation and dynamics. 
hot water where is it how's it circulate around and that's really and how's that affecting circulation that's going to be uh, an important factor as we look historically and in the future another factor is where ice uh, actually melts there's a lot of gravitational tug at antarctica and greenland two miles thick ice it just creates a gravitational attraction there's more the ocean's not flat we figured that out a few hundred years ago or several five six hundred the brave sailors took a trust and said, the, ocean, the earth's not flat. We know the ocean's not flat, um, but it's due to more gravity. And so it seems flat, but it's actually more of a tug. And as that ice melts and it contributes to global uh, sea level rise, that it, tug will lessen and there'll be an exacerbation far away from that source. Seems sort of esoteric, but it's something that has been a factor and we know it will be a factor. Gravity just is. But the third component, again, is vertical land motion. It's, it's moving for several reasons, natural and unnatural. Some natural reasons would be compaction in the Mississippi uh, sediments, some very high rates of, of, of compaction and, and vertical land uh, motion causing sea levels uh, rise at, at higher rates. Uh, we know that there's an adjustment from the last ice age over the mid-Atlantic that's still causing uh, uh, sea levels to actually rise because land is sinking. Uh, there used to be a tremendous amount of ice that was caused a compaction of the mantle, the crust underneath that big Laurentide ice sheet 13, 15,000 years ago, squished and pushed that mantle material elsewhere. It was that mid-Atlantic area. And now it's that mid, and that caused it the land to rise. Now that mantle material wants to go back to where it was because the ice is gone. It's not a quick process. It's occurring over thousands and thousands of years. It's, it's very viscous. So now we're sinking. But there's some unnatural reasons consumption of and, and pumping of fossil fuels and, and groundwater for consumption. That's a big issue in, in Western Gulf and it's an issue in the mid-Atlantic. We get a lot of drinking water from aquifers. You pump it, you remove that fluid, the sediments compact. So more things matter. Gulf Stream matters, circulation. I, I won't get too deep in that. Where ice melts matters. Mining of fossil fuels and drinking water really does matter. So when we look at uh, the trajectory along the contiguous United States, here are these, here's what it actually looks like, not on a global basis of that two meter, of the 1.5 meter, the one meter, the half meter global rise globally. When we look along the United States, this is what it would look like. It's a big colorful mess here. Um, but what to look at is the black is this average of the tide gauges through the last 50 years and the green is a fit to it. And we understand sort of out the next 30 years, can we use the last 50 to give us some guidance over the next 30 of just the observations? And then we align that with what the models are saying for the United States, taken as a whole. We really are going to get the models, and I'll show in a minute, down to one degree grids along the coastline. But taken as a whole, when we average it, the observation extrapolation, where we're headed, squarely overlaps with what these scenarios are showing in the next 30 years. That gives us greater confidence. We have two lines of evidence. See, the models, they're initialized with conditions, but then they're meant to run. And so they're sort of separate than what the observation trajectory are shown. So we have two lines of evidence pointing to the same uh, outcome, about a foot of sea level rise in the next 30 years, which would match about that foot of the last 100. So that was sort of the headline news of uh, two months ago. The observations and models agree, check, check. Uh, and compared to some previous estimates, all the models suggest over the next 30 years that regardless of emissions, there's built-in thermal momentum right now, we're headed on a trajectory, but that trajectory is really going to spread beyond that. So what we do now really is going to have an outcome uh, over the next perhaps 50 to 100 years. Right now, we're, we're sort of on a heading, but that heading it's it's a wild west and and we want to make sure we, we we do what we can and we'll talk about that we know it's not rising in the bathtub so this would be a forward looking in 30 years under that intermediate high scenario again if, if i go backwards you could pick any one of them and this would be on average the united states coastline a little bit higher than a foot we know you're higher in the east and gulf largely due to that land subsidence the vertical land sinking due to natural and unnatural reasons, as well as more heat. There's more water, uh, thicker water with the, the warm and the circulation, the Gulf Stream and, and such, that more so than on the West Coast. So this is important to know that it's not gonna be uniform. The risk is not gonna be the same. 
Um, in areas in Alaska, there's a tremendous amount of ice that's melting and glaciers are retreating. Land is actually rebounding. Yeah, things are dropping. They have a different problem. You can't get, you can't keep your dock close enough to the water because the water's literally in some of these areas are sinking about an inch every year or two. Or, or so the water is, is, is lowering. And where ice melts matters again, and that will have a differential signature on the United States. So these are all the things we factor in. So looking at 30 years, if we would have about a foot, foot and a half of sea level rise, this is the way it would play out along the United States coastline. And if we do the same thing and say, let's average our tide gauge measurements, we have over 200 tide gauges along the coast. They've been there for, for many reasons. But if we clump them and average them uh, and project out, that would be the green fit to the black observations. We can kind of get a sense of they are on a regional basis. They're landing squarely of what the models are suggesting, um, closer to some scenarios than the other, and that's fine. We can tune that. But on average, here would be sort of the amount of rise in the next 30 years relative to about now. So we have a foot, foot and a half on the east and Gulf Coast, a little bit less on the west in the Caribbean and the islands in Alaska. But again, we are able to provide this for, for decision makers so that they actually have the best information about, uh, from the agencies using the latest and greatest models and, and sets of data. When we look at 2150, here's how they diverge. And it's that intermediate to high that really requires increased heating, uh, increased emissions, you know, the trajectory, and then some, if we don't stem the flow, let's say, uh, as well as some of those uncertain ice sheet processes of Antarctica uh, really coming into play. It, it's quite a large range, up to 13 feet by uh, the next 130 years or so. In a worst case scenario, very unlikely, but we can't take it off the table. The more likely might be somewhere between the intermediate low and intermediate. But still, that's that's not good. When we look at meters, by the 2150, a meter and a half to, you know, over two meters or little little one to two meters, that that's a lot of water. We know again. Here's how it break down. Grand Isle is sinking, sinking rapidly. A lot of it has to do with compaction of sediments going on. It's really nothing we can do about that. And here's how that would factor in. It's That's the big problem right now for Grand Isle, for New Orleans. This land is just sinking. No matter what the ocean's doing, it's sinking, it's sinking fast. So this is hosted by NASA, but you can dive in and I'll show you towards the end where we can get this information to understand what are, what are the contributions to the overall projections? Where's it coming from and why? Okay. I can pause if there's any questions now, or I'm gonna sort of transition and say, here's mean sea level, but what are the impacts of that? And I can't see my screen to know if there's any chats or questions. Anybody wants to put any questions into the chat, I can go ahead and, and read them to Dr. Sweet. So feel free. Or questions we can, or comments so far. Or we can we can take them at the end. Maybe there's a lot of some more interesting stuff coming up that might no, we don't have anything at the moment. So, Great. all right. Well, it, it's not the mean that gets you. It's the, it's the extremes or it's the stuff, right? I, I live, I happen to live near the, the Chesapeake Bay and others you may, may spend time at the coast. You'd be pretty hard pressed to show me where mean sea level is, right? Because the water's constantly moving. It's going up and down. So what are the effects of sea level rise and what does it actually look like, right? That's our first challenge. Before we get people to take action, they got to understand, believe it, see it, feel it. And then we can talk. All right. This is what sea level rise looks like. Any guesses where this is from? Well, it's Norfolk. This church in the bottom left-hand corner was a great one. They, they had the tide calendar in their bulletin, or at least on the website, let folks know when they're going to be driving the water coming to church. It was in a very, uh, you know, the parting of the waters. Come on, let's go. Time to get to church. Charleston. Miami region. This is the kind of flooding that used to require a storm and now it doesn't. Sea level rise flooding of the United States coastline has begun. This used to require a storm three, two, three, four decades ago. Now, garden variety reasons why communities are flooding. Spring tide, king tide, change of prevailing winds. Maybe it rains and it's that much worse. Sunny day flooding. We started calling it something. So the real question is, right, we live in a society now where 
we have FEMA, we have flood insurance, you're in or out. It's not really a binary. If you're in, great, you're in the flood zone, but your risk is not the same. Do we know what the probability of your coastal asset, your loved one, your house, your church, you name it. What is the likelihood of that being flooded now and in the future? Do we have a governmental set of information that provides that? No, but we're working towards that. So what are the effects of sea level rise? Well, okay, we know there's perennial inundation, meaning that will just be just permanently flooded. The mean changes. But again, that's hard to, that's hard to visualize. I mean, you get a sense when we see pictures in Louisiana, right, where it just 10, 10 years ago, wow, look, and now it's open ocean. That's pretty rare. That's very high sea level rise rates there. Well, you know that as seas rise, the same storm 50 years ago and the same storm now, it's going to cause more flooding. But, you know, that that's the time that gets people's attention. Hurricane Sandy, the flooding of a of metro area. That oftentimes is when we start talking about climate change, but that isn't necessarily what I don't think these folks are thinking. Like, geez, sea level rise and climate change really got us. No, that was a, a whopper of a storm. And they happen and they have happened. They will continue to happen. Yes, the, the risk of water getting to a certain height increases the level rise, but it's sort of obscured by the rarity of events. You know, you roll the dice 100 times and you might get one, but you may not get one of these events in your lifetime. So it's kind of hard to start making the argument of sea level rise and climate change during these events. Better to look at the less extreme, the more tangible evidence of, of the thing that has happened, the increased frequency of these minor events. It's a more tangible indicator. And we gave it a name so folks could at least talk about it. What is sea level rise? Before about a decade ago, we didn't, we called it sea level rise and that was great. It was the end of the century problem, but it's here now and the impacts are happening. And we were, I was proud. We started calling it nuisance flooding. We don't call it that anymore, but even in Florida, five, six years ago, they couldn't say sea level rise, couldn't say climate change, but you could say nuisance flooding. We gave it a name and people started using it. And they started writing about it. And we started talking about it. I know I'm sort of tooting my own horn, uh, but it's important. It, it's finally, we had the evidence that these impacts were already happening in front of our eyes and it was sea level rise. It was increased frequency of these minor flood events that were happening more and more often. And it was registering and resonating with longtime residents who could see it, understand it, humanize the data that we were putting out. And so what, what is the data we're putting out? So we really have made headways in aligning the, uh, the data with weather warning levels. So the weather service, you've lived at the coast or inland, you may not recognize, but if there's an event coming, you'll have that kind of automated voice saying, you know, National Weather Service is issuing a coastal flood watch or a coastal flood warning. They have different severity and consequences. And they'll tell you to do different things. And so... We thought, well, what a great idea. Let's let's align this with these levels because they really speak to the vulnerability or the exposure and the vulnerabilities of our infrastructure and people on the ground due to current conditions, our current footprint, our current climate, the way everything's set. Here are the levels. And so we we mined this and we did some statistical work basically to come up saying base of years of impact monitoring. We know when minor flooding is about 1.75 or up to maybe two feet, and moderate flooding and major flooding above the zero again would be this average high tide. So that would be the high tide on average. So, you know, typically if you're thinking the beach, well, you know, the high tides, if you live there long enough, you know, the water comes up to about here, or if you're in a city, it gets to about this high in the bulkhead. Minor flooding is typically disruptive, the cumulative toll of which the increased frequency, sunny days is becoming uh, more of an issue. Moderate flooding is typically damaging. The issue of coastal flood warning saying there's significant risk of uh, of, of risk to personal property. Major flooding is usually definitely storm driven. And it's often a risk to human uh, life and it's destructive. You're going to be replacing things after that four foot type of flood on the majority of the United States coastline. Moderate is typically damaging and it's very much disruptive. And we'll talk more about that, but let's use these thresholds to speak to how sea level is changing and the frequency of these events are changing. And so when we take the minor, again, coded in red. When we do this on average, we see that same foot of sea level rise in blue over the United States. We started making counts. And here's shown on a national average, right? That didn't really speak to a location, but the average location would show that we have doubled our flood frequency rate just in the last 20 years. If you fit a line through that red column plots, you, you could you would see what I'm saying. But it's accelerating. It's not linear. It's an upward curving line. 
And so we're using these thresholds not only to give warning. This would be uh, from a couple of weeks ago. I gave a talk in, let's see, well, Annapolis, because that's where I live. Right. So with the blue, my the, the cyan colors, like where are we expecting water levels to go? And here are these flood levels to give people a heads up. Uh, the blue is just the astronomic tide, the high tide, low tide. But it doesn't take in consideration the winds blowing and the red is where you are. And I know when it hits the red, because I live there, water is going to be up to our fire pit. It's going to be covering our docks. We've got to turn the power off because there's all electrical problems with, you know, causing shock, you know, real first world problem there right this yeah. is the impacts of sea level rise it's really happening but it's also getting the storefronts in downtown annapolis and now people aren't shopping and well that's a problem for owners uh it's a problem because people the main corridor between eastport and annapolis cl they close off compromise street and that naval academy floods so these levels here would be a snapshot of the highest tide uh, and daily, it's very clumped up. You can hardly see it, right? It's all lumped up, but that's the highest water level, uh, a daily maximum water level with these flood levels in place. Now, um, back then you hardly, you know, 70 years ago, you hardly ever crossed it. It took a hurricane to cross that minor flood threshold. And you fast forward 30 years, up, oh, a couple more blips. Fast forward 30 more years. Wow, we're Many reasons to cross that line, and that is today's flood. The minor flooding begins at that height. And if you think about that range from on the y-axis would be meters of height above that average high tide, zero. So even the highest daily tide might be below the average high tide, right? The water never got up that high, but typically they're higher, they're weighted higher. But if I form a distribution, it would form that bell-shaped curve. And here's that bell-shaped curve from back then. And the probability on the y-axis means, you know, it, it's everything, the, 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 the normal distribution, right? We all got graded about it in, in class. We all got Cs, or hopefully the teacher was nice, we all got Bs. A few As, a few Fs. Very rare as you get out there above the high tide shown on the x-axis. Again, yeah. one meter. One meter is about three, three to four feet. Fast forward in time. Fast forward in time. That's sea level rise. And there we are with our flood defenses, and it's starting to hit up against our, our, our society. And we're close to getting underneath, and we are in many locations already under the fat of the curve. And that's 365 days on average in a given year would be that area under the curve. And we're getting to that point where it's very nonlinear. It's about to really jump up a little bit of sea level rise, inches matter. Boy, you're, it seems like you're flooding all the time now. And we're developing products. You can go and see, wow, that was Galveston. It's really starting to ramp up in the last decade or two. Our freeboard is disappearing in front of our eyes. Weather forecasting in, in Charleston, beautiful spot. It's not just the tide gauge telling us that. It's the actual number of times you're hearing it on the radio, hearing it on the TV. National Weather Service in Charleston is issuing coastal flood warning for the following areas. These are the type of impacts. That would be shown in orange. The black would be the number of days per year that we exceeded that threshold at that tide gauge height. It's not warning fatigue, it's more flooding. And we're hearing about it more and it's affecting our daily activities. It's a great climate meet weather, weather meet climate story. Here would be instead of those bar or column plots, they're shown as uh, dots. That would be the number of times that year where water level exceeded that height in Norfolk. And you see it's not linear, it's accelerating. And if we just follow that trajectory out, more or less is what we're able to do now. We can give an air bar of saying that line fits it well, but there's a little bit of standard deviation, some statistical stuff. We can give a range to let you know what you should expect next year because there's a cost to defend, to shut people, pumps, manpower, their women power. You've got to, you've got to spend money to react to flooding in our society until we build the the, the, the uber defense, right? That keeps the water out and we don't flood and we don't need to spend on flooding. It's like particular snowy year. Do you have enough salt? Do you have enough trucks? Do you have enough people ready? Because it's going to be a snowy year. Well, we know it's going to be a flood year future. It's already happening and expenditures are increasing and communities are asking for, what do I plan for next year? And that acceleration, that curve, it's pretty widespread now. Most of these communities are now accelerating, meaning once you recognize you have a 70-day flood problem, water coming out of your storm system, storm sewers onto your streets, 
it's going to grow chronic rather quickly. It's not a slow, gradual change. It's this acceleration, and it's going to continue that way. So we're sort of letting folks know now, hey, it's, it's coming. It's happening in front of your eyes. You're accelerating now. If you're in harm's way, if you're getting flooded now, you should expect more of that. And if you're not, be prepared because it's coming. It's going to grow deeper and more widespread. And so here's another product that we're making at NOAA where we kind of give some historical perspective. How many did you have on average 20 years ago? What was your record? What did you have last year? What are we expecting next year? How about in the next couple decades, just to put it into perspective? So I'll leave you to, to explore, but you can click on each one of these dots or sets of information that we provide where we have these tide gauge uh, currently installed. All right, I'm almost done with these confusing plots and I do apologize, but engineers design, the Army Corps designed by these kind of things. So what we see on the x-axis is, and this is one of the advanced, I'm not gonna get in the details, but there is not a product right now that is operational for the United States that gives you this kind of information away from a tie gauge. And we, we did that in this last report when we provided the data. And what this shows on the x-axis is the average recurrence interval, meaning happens about once a year once every 10 years, once every 100 years. And that's a sort of misnomer. You don't want to call it that. The 100-year event actually has a 1% annual chance of happening in any given year under current sea levels. The point one would be 10 events per year. And so we can line up. Uh, this would be on average. I think this is Tampa Bay. I just gave a talk down there. We can see where FEMA's probabilities are for the 1% or the 10%. And the FEMA, they do a good job, but it's backwards looking. But they simulate storms that haven't happened. Well, you haven't happened. They might happen. It could happen under today's climate. Let's simulate that so we don't get caught off guard. What we show here in the, the blue lines, what we designed is based on tie gauge observations. We're working with FEMA to, to consolidate these two curves because they're recognizing uh, costs are starting to stack up on this higher frequency part of the domain, the things that are happening once a year, five times or once every five years. Um, and so we still have work to improve, but we are providing information now along the United States coastline that really gives a tide gauge based estimate, not FEMA's estimate. We're not trying to do what they do, but give them other sets of information and more importantly, how that's gonna change with sea level rise. So here on the Y axis is that height above the average sea level. So for instance, the major flood event, that yellow line, it happens about once tw every 20 years. So that'd be better characterized as the 5% annual chance. And every given year under today's sea level, you have about a 5% chance of rolling that set of dice. You know, that Yahtzee is gonna show up and if it does, water level is getting to 1.2 meters, four feet above average high tide. That's a major flood event that's causing serious damage. Okay, as you raise sea levels, then that whole curve rises up. So now your, your moderate event, your major becomes your moderate, your moderate becomes minor. Because remember, we haven't changed our flood defenses. So we're mapping this. We're helping to graduate FEMA's floodplain. Okay, it's not binary any longer. Minor, moderate, major aligning with these thresholds. Let's map these elevations in communities and show at least what's in harm's way, what's potentially exposed. And combining that, we can now tell you what's the likelihood under, let's say, contemporary environment, contemporary syllabus, what's the likelihood of that getting wet? And let them determine what, uh, what the vulnerabilities, what the damages are, what they need to do about it. And we also, proje we're projecting this in the future, but I'm not gonna show that, I'll show it on individual dots, but we're working to make these maps, we're working with FEMA, their National Risk Hazard Index, uh, which looks at lots of different hazards and what that's costing and bundling up for communities and how that, that risk varies around the country. Elevation matters. It does. Lower elevations, you're just at more risk. As these things transition from storm surges to more common tidal flooding, the tide's going to go where the tide wants to go. It goes up back bays. It goes through storm uh, sewers. It goes up tidal creeks. It affects uh, groundwater elevations. It's no longer the storm coming in at the beachfront. Don't think of sea level rise as rising at the beachfront. It's all these urban cities. It's Norfolk, it's New York City, it's Boston, it's anywhere that water wants to be. It's not the breaking wave environment. Elevation matters. The lower elevation at greater risk. So what is putting this back? And I'll have a couple more slides. So if, if we go with the expected sea level rise in the next 30 years, what we just showed earlier to say, by region by region, and then we even take it to a location and say, here's your projection, your scenarios, modeled scenarios, here are your observations, here's how they're aligning, here's what you should expect at a minimum. Here's the skinny. If you're going to, to Las Vegas, you're going to roll the dice, you know, bet on this at least. It, it 
it could be higher. It's probably not going to be much lower. And you'd be, you know, what are you trying to achieve by assuming it's going to be lower? You know, you have a greater probability of it being higher than, than this midline that we're about to give you. Well, with about a foot of sea level rise, we know that minor, moderate, major flooding, we're about a foot apart. So we're expecting a flood regime shift if we don't do anything about it. And there will be significant consequences to infrastructure, to communities. I haven't even talked about ecosystems, right? But that's if we don't change. And this is pretty much going to happen, at least the sea level rise part. So when we look on average, shown in the, the boxes here in 2020 and then 2050, the top ones are the minor flood events, the moderate, the major. So about two feet would be the, the top left and right plots, about three feet deep would be the, the middle and then about four feet deep, right? Major causes serious uh, risk to life and property, lots of damages. So what we see with this one foot of sea level rise, and it's not one foot everywhere, but I've tuned it correctly. We see that the, in 2050, moderate flooding will start occurring. A national average will be higher in a lot of locations, less than some will be more frequent than the moderate, than the minor flooding today. So the new high tide flooding that's happening several times in many communities will be a foot deeper. It'll be more impactful. And the major flooding will occur about the same frequency as the moderate flooding. 0.2 events per year, about a 20% a annual chance, right? That becomes, uh, compared to what it is now, about a 4% chance, right? So you compare the bottom left to the bottom right. You know, you've just, you've changed your dice now. You, you used to have one through six on five dice. Now you just have one through three and you're, you know, and it is your risk increases. You're more likely to have these events with sea level rise if we don't do anything because the gap, the freeboard, the distance between the average high tide and our infrastructure is closing. And for perspective, Norfolk, this is when water is about six inches to upwards of a foot of the crown of the road leading into the Norfolk base. This is not that road, but this is moderate flooding, about three feet. This, hap this used to happen about every five years or 20% annual chance in 1990. Today, you get about one event per year, maybe two days per event. You know, it's probably still a, a nor'easter coming through or it's not that serious. It happens once a year. There's several reasons why this might happen. 2050, it's in our headlights, five to 10 events per year. That's a problem for these people. It's a problem for the Norfolk Naval Base and they're not alone. So it's these kind of events that are going to become much more common, much more impactful uh, and it's already occurring in front of our eyes, whether we recognize it or not. If you happen to live in a coastal coastal town and talk to your, your folks that are monitoring the situation, they'll tell you. We have a few places you can access information that I'm talking about, and I'll have a closing slide in a minute for some thoughts. Uh, NOAA, we're starting to consolidate our products around sea level rise. We're not really told to do this, but we're starting to take initiative because this is increasingly important. We're starting to get authorization from Congress to do this kind of work. So we're consolidating our tools, working with our federal partners, several sets of information you can click on to get maps, get projections, find out more about this report, trends, county snapshots, a wealth of information. There's also, I would say, there's educational information. You know, wh why is this happening? What does this mean? There, there's some great uh, tutorials and there's some podcasts. NASA has a great site working with them. You can get a lot of the data and make sense of why is it changing? Where is it coming from? Contributions as shown earlier. But my last slide, um, just a few thoughts. I know I didn't give, you know, ideas of where you can find out more and what are the impacts and mitigation, because that's not really what I do. But I tell you what I think about and I'm able to write about in the National Climate Assessment is the U.S. policies favor concentration of high value assets, right? I think we know that. Um, we, areas that are of high importance and high wealth, we put, by gosh, that really makes sense. And you can make the economic case very quickly to say, those are the areas that we need to protect and we'll spend our money doing it. And we meaning the United States government. So the U S army Corps of engineers, risk reduction projects, they have a big one down in Texas, Texas spine. I was just down in Houston. I remember my dad telling a really neat story about civil rights back then in Houston, what a wonderful story it was. And a lot of on Rice University. This time that Rice University helped sponsor a, a Society of Environmental Journalists uh, workshop and we toured the Houston Shipping Channel. Whew. There's a lot of petrol activity on the Houston Shipping Channel. It was mind boggling. 
but the amount of money we're about to spend as a country, tens of billions of dollars for this Texas spying to protect this, right? Because it's a high value. If this gets knocked out, this is where a lot of our fuel, over a quarter of our fuel uh, production is coming. But in the back of my mind, you just, and we actually talked about it. it the, the emissions are coming out of this area. And this is what's actually causing storms to get stronger and seas to rise. And it makes sense to, well, the economic case is very clear to say we need to protect it. Storm and wastewater systems within many coastal regions are already functionally integrated. Water is coming up through stormwater systems. And if it rains, most of this, what I just talked about, wasn't about rainfall, it was about ocean related. There's other things causing flooding. When it rains, that water has nowhere to go. There's legal issues of sort of liability. And there's already been some court cases playing out between insurance industries and, and municipalities saying, we knew you were undersized and now we're flooding and we don't wanna pay these repeat claims. But it was inland, it was a Chicago farmer's insurance, and they couldn't clearly uh, state that the climate had been changing, rainfall had been changing. But there's also water quality issues. When the, you have these high tide floods, septics are starting to fail. Uh, waste uh, stormwater systems, again, that comes, it's a dirty environment we live in. And the water, they're starting to test and, and recognize that we're starting to have very poor water quality after these high tide flood events in many of these communities. That's a problem but there's a cost to upgrade these storm and wastewater systems, a big cost and it's looming. There's ecosystem impacts. I haven't even talked about other things than humans, right? This world was made for us. Well, what about everything else around us? Um, as some would, would, would argue um, about the world being made for us. The ocean warming, right? It has, it's, it's, it's causing an issue. It's acidification of the oceans. Coral reefs are disappearing. They're having hard times, bivalves. The, the ocean is, is shifting. Seas are rising. Uh, where we have marsh grasses, we've already built a lot of things. There's nowhere for these marsh grasses to, to move. And lastly, emissions matter. The thermal memory, the momentum of the ocean, the long residence time of CO2, 500 to 1,000 years once CO2 gets up in the atmosphere, it doesn't fluctuate that much. Uh, seasonally, it will, but it, it's there until we start deciding how to remove it. Uh, the thermal momentum, about one degree, for every one degree C, the, the multi the couple thousand year commitment based on historical geological records is about two meters of sea level rise. Two degrees C, we want to aim for that 1.5. Well, we've got sea level rise going on for the next several generations and talk about that for an entitlement cost or the, the entitlement that doesn't really give us anything of, of value except problems. So, you know, we're able to say this, it, Noah, because it is the science and it's important for folks to know and it's important for groups like you all to know because you are the activists that really come in with a moral and, and ethical conscience of saying, you know, the data is clear. It's not political, it, it's science and there are implications and we need to understand and recognize this and we need to, what we're trying to do at NOAA and other agencies is put the data in a manner, more meaningful metrics that folks can identify with, which is importantly, increasingly important about things like climate that seem to be slower evolving in people's eyes. It's not whether it's not quick, but it's there if we open our eyes. So a colleague of mine, this was a holdover from my other slide, NASA, my other second author, um, NOAA and NASA, there was other folks, but if you do have questions, feel free to reach out to myself, um, NASA, Ben Hamilton, terrific individual, uh, among others in, in that report. And we're happy to um, answer questions you might have. And, and hopefully there's some time tonight for some additional conversation. So with that, uh, that concludes the actual presentation and happy to, to have discussion. OK, folks. Um... There are some questions already in the chat, and uh, let me see if we can find those quick. Are there relative estimates of the economic damage that correlate with your flood categories? Well, uh, good question. The big, we're having problems. Well, let's say it's not clear uh, yet. The billion dollar disasters, the big events, yes. Um, and we know billion dollar disasters are going up. And that's something that NOAA monitors and we hear about. The lesser extreme information, it's still a challenge. There have been some scientific papers that are looking at the damage curves, um, engineering curves, the design of what the cost benefit are and what's already occurred would suggest that the lesser extremes now are starting to catch up in terms of overall costs, sort of indirect and cumulative costs. But, you know, getting the industry 
in municipality and the Chamber of Commerce's data on you know what have costs been expenditures to date is not an easy mining exercise. So that's something that we do talk to folks like Google and others that have access to lots of different data sets to say, to direct the real economic costs, yes, we need to better understand what the economic damages have been across the board. But one thing that I do point folks to is the chronology of these events as they occur in places like Norfolk and Charleston and Miami. When have they decided that enough's enough and they are starting to invest and in taking out municipal bonds to upgrade their stormwater and then some? You know, at what point was that threshold crossed? So we do have evidence in several key towns and cities, namely Norfolk, Charleston, Miami, but there's others, New York, Boston, um, that are spending money now to address problems that are real and they're not doing it necessarily for the long term, though they have that in mind, they're already spending money now. But overall national uh, costs, we hope to get a little bit more out of the FEMA's nas uh, risk, national risk index, which is sort of packaged up to allow for our county to county census block to understand how costs have been changing. So that's in the works, um, but definitely best way to communicate with people's with <laughs> money talks. And that's something that we, we, we would like to do better, but we're primarily the science organization dealing with the actual data, the models and, and not dealing as much with the socioeconomic consequences of. So Becky writes, I'm worried about people moving to the Midwest when the coasts start to move inland. How much land will disappear mm -hmm. in Florida? How many people will be affected? Again, you have those different levels of severity, I guess. Um, well, like I, I tell, I do a lot of media and, and you know, one thing's for certain, it's, you know, the whole world's not crashing in on us, even though it, it feels like it many times when we turn on the news. Um, yes. Sea level rise is, is an issue and it's not going away. It will get worse. But let's say 2050, a foot, foot and a half. I mean, we're not talking about just Miami going underwater, right? I had to deal with the NBC reporter now. They're like, we had some reporting to say, like, when is, when is Florida going to be underwater? I'm like, you're not putting me on record saying that because if I tell you that the intermediate scenario, maybe three feet of sea level rise in Miami region is perhaps possible you know maybe it has a 10 percent chance the way we model it a little two feet seems more plausible three feet four feet could happen but um we're talking about the first six feet of elevation or so in many of these communities that are being going not going underwater but will be exposed to more you know something exposed to something that happens maybe once every 10 years to maybe happening annually we're not talking about the end of the world but what we are talking about is major costs associated with right people's houses, second homes, storm, wastewater facilities that need to be upgraded. So there will be, I don't think a mass exodus, but I think there's going to be a real cost involved uh, at some point and it's already starting to happen, right? We see it now through FEMA expenditures, but it's really gonna start happening at those municipal because solutions are found and funded locally and they're taking out bonds now and eventually it's getting into the state level. Well, shouldn't we continue to have our beaches? You know, Who's going to pay for this? So collectively, Right now, it's a social system we have in place. We will all pay for the uh, the fixes that are going to be needed. I don't see a, a mass migration occurring, at least in the United States, within the next 50 years. But 2100, 21 beyond, I mean, there there is a real possibility of having some serious costs and some serious uh, un, you know, relocation that is maybe perhaps uh, not voluntary. Mark, you want to share your question? Oh, sure. I was just wondering if you can speak to the sort of impacts being seen in developing countries where a lot of the, the poor are forced to live in very low lying areas and are being routinely flooded. And of course, that's increasing every year. Well, that, yeah, and that is occurring. So outside of the United States, you know, places like Bangladesh and others, we know they're already low lying, but there are a lot of people living right close to the water. Jakarta, they're pumping tremendous amount of groundwater. They're going to relocate. Um, there are people who are increasingly due to land use practices. A lot of it's pumping of groundwater in these Delta areas where a lot of people tend to live. The compaction of the sediments are already occurring. They're pumping groundwater. They're exposed to hurricanes, uh, sea levels rising, public health is going down. It, it is a problem. And they have some of the fastest rates in, in some of the Asian countries of sea level rise that we measure and we know. Um, 
what the consequence of eventually it's going to become clear but it's it's something i don't really have hard facts on but lucky us to live in an area that typically has pretty safe drinking water um wastewater systems that aren't you know that are still functioning and allowing us to live a fairly decent life and that's probably half the problem if we were drinking from and eating from our local water sources we would probably recognize very quickly that we have a, a much larger problem on our hands than we currently do but we're industrialized we're a little bit ahead of the curve uh we're buffered from some immediate impacts but they are occurring and, and it will only get worse you are in church terms preaching to the choir a lot of the people here are already concerned about environmental issues how is your findings being received by policymakers? Are you getting a really good hearing and response from people in Congress, from the Biden administration? How, how are the politicians responding to this news? Um, well, they have been, we've given a lot of congressional staffer briefings. Um, seems to be a lot of interest, uh, politics aside, Democrats, Republicans, um, definitely given this information. The one thing we are able to more um, firmly say is what to expect in the next 30 years. And that's, we haven't said that as a government before, right? In the scientific world, right, sea level is likely to be X and X amount, perhaps as high as this, but that was, that was the scientists talking. That wasn't the government agencies talking to its own people. So, you know, the term, let's take it to the bank of saying a foot of sea level rise in the next 30 years in certain areas higher, here are the here's what's coming down. Don't say we didn't tell you. Um, and here are the sets of products and services we're building around these sets of numbers could be higher. We'll provide that as well. It's been well received. And believe it or not, just down in Florida, you know, they're really taking this seriously. I, it's it's a phase of matter. It's water. When it's in your street, it's at your feet. You can't go inside and turn on your AC and say, global warming, what are you talking about? I don't feel it. They see it, they're experiencing it, and it's bipartisan there's there's support there and there's being money uh funded and we're getting support from both sides of the the aisle on this so i would say it, it's it's real it's happening and folks are starting to really know that and now when money's starting to be dished out people are saying okay well i'm 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 here i'm in the receiving line actually could i get in first in line you know so that's almost a good thing for our part people see it and they 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 really want their share Again, then the fairness and equity thing starts to come into play, which, you know, as a government agency, we want to make sure every organization, tribal, state, big, large, has the same access to information. So folks are spending their precious dollars on solutions, not is this real and how fast and where is it occurring? There was a recent administration that had great difficulty acknowledging climate change and pulled us out of the Paris Agreement. Um, did that impact your agency a few years ago or as things pretty much above political uh, presidential administration? Who's the president? Does that matter or not to you guys? Um, you know, we're fairly insular from, from this. Again, coming from the tide gauge group, major ports, um, shipping is such an industry from Red and blue states alike, everyone wants their tie gauge, everyone wants the information. And we just start saying, look, we're using level one surveying techniques each year to make sure this data is accurate. We speak to surveys, we speak to builders. They they believe the data. I've been putting out these, the report I just showed was something that comes out every four or five years, but annually I've been putting out, we, Noah, uh, with some colleagues have been putting out these high tide flood reports, keeping the score. Where are we, the climate jumpy? That has been going on since 2014. No one's told us to stop. Other questions, comments? You can either use the chat or uh, at the bottom of your screen in Zoom, there's a, on the far right bottom, there's something called reactions. And if you click that, there's a, something that says raise hand. And if you raise, click the raise hand, you're at the top of the screen, right in the corner. And we can see that you, you know, looks like Mark has his hand raised, so. A demonstration of the hand raised, but uh, a, a question, a sort of a comment and a question, maybe something you can expand on. Uh, 
in, in Florida, uh, especially Miami Beach, when they started getting a lot of the sunny day flooding, uh, the flooding during the king tides and such, they they started taking the usual approaches of trying to you know shore up. Uh, walls, sea walls, and things of that sort. They uh, were running into the problem that water was backing up through the storm drains that went into the intercoastal waterway. So they're putting in one-way valves and so forth and putting in pumps and it was all great. And then the next year, what they started encountering was that the water, the seawater was actually just percolating up out of their lawns because it was, you know, it was rising so much and uh, uh, the, the issue was coming to them no matter what they did. And I, I wonder if you can just sort of expand on, on what it, these uh, nuisance and, and rainy day, sunny day flood events are often like in these locations and how people experience this. Um, well, yeah, so getting back to the walls and, and the previous question, I guess the one thing I did uh, before going on a couple live interviews and one of our comms folks said, um, can't build a wall everywhere, right? But that was three or four years ago. And they're like, no, we're not gonna even talk about walls. Walls are not in our in our vocabulary. But even if you could build a wall everywhere, oftentimes they won't work, right? And they're good for certain things. Storm surges coming over the top, great. Build it higher, block the surge. Water finds a way, the wall stops, or you're in, you're in Florida or other types of substrate. Florida, it's very porous, but yeah, water comes up. We have a lot of urban conduits. We build it for water to come out, but water starts going in, as you mentioned. So there are some fixes for that. But the groundwater issue, as the USGS has these groundwater wells, which is really interesting, and in they're around the country. And they know that as mean high, high water or average high tide, if you, right, the water's going up each day, but you take the highest water level each day and you kind of average it, the groundwater table slowly rises up from that level as you go inland and it kind of conforms to the topography to an extent. This is the capillary action that's rising water up. As sea levels go up, groundwater has been going up too. So they are starting to find more and more areas where, and, and if you have measurements, the tide comes in, there's a delayed response, the water level, the inland groundwater rises up, right? And it's a delayed response because you have to get through this permeable, this sediment layers and what have you, but they see oscillations, like almost tidal oscillations in the groundwater tables, but they're starting to breach the surface in many communities. And it's starting to make farming less of a uh, less viable option in places like Delmarva Peninsula, up where I live, uh, uh, Delaware, Maryland, um, areas of the Hawaiian, uh, the Pacific Islands we haven't even talked about. So there are some of these less salient effects of high tide flooding that you know are starting to be shown. But the actual flooding themselves, it was interesting. I have a colleague who used to work for the South Florida Water Management uh, District. And I asked him, I was like, well, when did Miami decide to pull the trigger on spending all this money? It was like, well, when we started having one to two sunny day flood events, people were like, that's enough. So you know, living in Annapolis, it literally, uh, you could have an event, the wind's blowing, but the, the water literally just will reach on the tidal cycle. It'll come up and it just, there are seasons to it, right? We, we know that in the fall and more likely in the Southeast because there's a seasonal cycle to sea level. Believe it or not, sea levels are about a foot higher than there in the fall than the winter. And that's a cycle that just goes on. It's not sea level rise. But then the high tides come and it starts to flood and it just overtops seawalls. It comes over docks. Um, but in the winter time, the water's super low, right? And so that's not the time to go out. That, that's like a famous congressional person saying, look, it's global warming. I'm making snowballs. What in the world do you mean global warming? You know, that you could have the same reaction if you observed an area you were in the winter time and you're like, well, seas are super low. What are you talking about? So there's a seasonality you need to be attuned to and the, the, the communities are, but it literally is water will come into the streets and people are driving through salt water as in my community in Annapolis, but Norfolk and areas. And they put things on stilts to say, let's get out of harm's way. It works for hurricanes, it works for high tide flooding, but you're still driving through it, still getting storm waters backed up, wastewater is starting to fail, things in the ground that aren't meant to be saturated with, ground, with saltier groundwater, uh, saltification start to corrode. So there's just a host of problems. Some are visible, some are in closing on that statement. We have given briefings to senators, congressmen that said, Fooey, I don't see it. And I was like, you know, your response is, well, go talk to your storm or wastewater managers in these cities and ask them if they see it. And they're starting to put these sensors in these stormwater systems to show that whether or not you're seeing the flooding, boy, water is now backing up and it is almost full of capacity already because of the high tides. 
and they see this and they know it. So whether or not your eyes are open to it, there are people that understand it and see it. And so it takes many different shapes, but some of it's obvious and that's definitely the time for teachable moments. You're flooding more often than you used to. This is sea level rise. If it hasn't breached the surface, there are other ways of making sense of it. I think um, we're gonna stop for a moment and s stop the recording um, because there are some people who may have questions who don't want them recorded and put on YouTube. And uh, we'll, we'll 